Welcome to the Beyond the Bin presentation. I'm Kate DeChesre. I'm a green business advisor, and my co-host tonight is Heather Robinson, who is a recycling project specialist. So a little housekeeping as we get started. Um, for best viewing, we recommend selecting the side-by-side -side mode or docking your video participants to either the side or the bottom of your screen. And um, if you have any technical issues, please drop a message in the chat box and we have a colleague on the line that's gonna try and help out. And if you have questions, just go ahead and add those to the Q&A function. And we're gonna have um, some colleagues responding as we go throughout the presentation. And we'll also save about 10 minutes or so um, for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, we are recording this webinar and we will be sending a follow-up email to everybody that will include the slides as well as a bunch of links that we're gonna be sharing today. So don't feel like you need to write everything down. And I'm gonna turn off my video just for the sake of connectivity. All right, so today we will explore strategies that you might use before you end up putting something in a bin, whether that's the recycling bin or even your donation bin. And this is what we call the bin mindset. So we'll start by covering a little bit of some background and the pros and cons of our current recycling and donation systems. And then we'll move into exploring terms like reuse, repair, and repurpose. And then we can see how we can put all these practices, um, put these into practice at home or at work. So we're gonna start with why think beyond the bin. So many of us have what we're calling a bin mindset. So generally when people want to get rid of unwanted items, we have a few options besides sending them to the landfill. So we could set it out for collection in our mixed recycling or glass recycling, or we could take it somewhere like to a recycling center or a charity drop off or a roadside donation bin. We trust that the systems work as intended and that our materials are getting recycled or reused. And in many cases that does happen. But as we continue to get more and more stuff, these systems are strained. And not only that, but the spin mindset only focuses on what happens to an item after we get it and use it. And it doesn't really touch on what happens before we have the item in our possession. So what we're gonna focus on today and what we hope that you'll leave this presentation with a better understanding of, of is how to think beyond the bin. So this way of thinking means we're reducing consumption by refusing what we don't need or reusing and repairing to get the most out of what we have. It's using the various strategies that we'll discuss later before we discard something into a bin, whatever bin that is. And I wanted to introduce this vision that the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality or the DEQ published several years ago as a response to the limitations of and the challenges to our current system. The vis this vision was a fundamental shift for waste reduction programs in Oregon, going from managing discards to managing materials through their whole life cycle. This vision is that Oregonians in 2050 produce and use materials responsibly conserving resources, which is really about using them for their highest and their best use until they're no longer needed. It also says protecting the environment, which is calling out those upstream and downstream impacts of using resources and then living well, which means preventing and reducing these impacts on our physical and mental wellness. A significant portion of this plan is focused on the beyond the bin thinking strategies that we'll cover later because the DEQ found that reduce, reuse, repair, and other beyond the bin strategies have a larger positive impact. So for example, extending the life of products could reduce emissions 20 times more than recycling. And not only that, but reduce, reuse and repair industries are local in most cases and the benefits stay in the community that they serve. And most resources, most resources are used and most environmental damage occurs upstream during the production phase. But what does that mean? Um, so I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page so we'll define some terms. So when I say impact, I'm referring to the resources and energy used to make the product. Most of the impact of a product occurs before you even buy it. This happens in the production steps, which are the steps circled in green, and in the distribution and retail steps, which are the steps circled in orange. These steps are referred to as the upstream in impacts, which come from extracting materials, producing or manufacturing products, and then transportation. Then, of course, we have the use of the product, which is the steps circled here in blue. 
So when we only think and uh, think about an item's recyclability or disposal, we don't take into account any of these steps that we have circled on the screen. The disposal or end of life management is circled with purple dashes, and this is commonly known as downstream. So downstream is the impact after you dispose of a product. Now, because of all these things, focusing on what you buy or do not buy is more important than focusing on where it goes when you're done with it. To think about this concept in another way, let's look at some examples. For all materials consumed in Oregon, the disposal or that end of life represents only about 1.5% of the carbon emissions. In these examples, we have an example piece of clothing, a common electronic device, and something from your mix recycling. You can see how small the purple portion is, which represents the disposal, and compare that to the production and even use, which is the blue and green. So again, it's not just about what you do with the product when you're done with it. We really need to consider the whole life cycle. And to understand that better, we're going to look deeper at three examples um, to really get a look at that life cycle and understand the unintended consequences. So these examples are clothing, electronics, and mixed recycling. And we're going to jump right in with the mixed recycling. So I want to be clear, though, recycling isn't bad, and it does work much of the time. So recycling is one of the easiest, most feel-good environmental actions that you can take. And when a recycled material rather than a raw material is used to make a new product, natural resources and energy are conserved. The concept of recycling is logical. You put specific materials in your bin, they get processed, and then used as feedstock for new items. It works, and we're pretty good at it in Oregon. According to the Oregon Beverage Recycling Coalition, Oregon recycled over 80% of the beverage containers, which is double the national average and higher than most states. And this is due in large part to the bottle bill, which offers an incentive for recycling beverage containers. Additionally, the DEQ found that in 2018, 2.3 million tons of material were recovered in Oregon, which prevented 3.3 million metric tons of carbon emissions, which is not insignificant. But as I mentioned, there are challenges. One of them being that the contamination rate is typically about 8 to 13% in most areas, but can be as high as 20% in some locations. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Also, it's estimated that bottled water uses 17 million barrels of oil, which is slightly more than it would take to fill up 1 million cars with fuel for a year. And this is an example of upstream impacts, which we're going to chat a little bit more about. So as informed consumers, we should also consider the upstream impacts, which again are those impacts from extracting materials, producing or manufacturing the product, and then transporting the product. These impacts apply across the board for common re mixed recycling, and they include habitat destruction from the mining, the drilling, the fracking, and the deforestation. And then with that comes endangered species. We also have social injustices to indigenous and local populations. And then there's also air and water pollution from the production itself. So you'll remember from our discussion early, earlier, nearly two-thirds of the impacts come in the upstream phases. So really, while recycling items in our curbside bin is great and we should do it correctly, we also have an opportunity to have a greater impact by thinking beyond the bin. Now, switching gears a bit to look at the downstream impacts, one of the biggest issues in, is contamination. Um, and this happens when people throw materials in their bins that they're unsure of with the hope that they'll be recycled or sorted correctly. And this is also called wish cycling. So this wish cycling, whether it's intentional or not, causes major issues. For example, when people put plastic bags in their curbside recycling, they get caught in the sorting screens at the recycling center. And not only that, uh, that not only reduces the effectiveness of the sorting process, for other items, but the facility has to shut down the entire operation to then go in and to remove the bags. And this contamination can have impacts beyond our region. Um, improperly sorted materials is one reason that many countries have stopped accepting scrap plastic from countries like the U.S. The countries were importing our scrap plastic, um, they reduced their allowable contamination to 0.5%, which is just not realistic for us in the, in the U.S. So this really brought attention to this issue in our country and forced us to rethink our recycling systems, which is a good thing. And it was also the right move for the to reduce the negative environmental impacts that were happening in the countries that were importing our scrap plastic to be recycled. 
we were essentially sending them trash while many of us here in the U.S. felt like we were doing a good job of recycling our scrap plastic. But as consumers, we didn't know the whole story because oftentimes we don't hear about these upstream and downstream impacts. And now Heather is going to share another example here. All right. Thanks, Kate. So we've started to review why relying on recycling as a way to manage our waste and achieve our environmental hopes and dreams isn't quite enough. Although a lot of the rec recent recycling news has been about contamination of mixed recycling, you know, in some situations, even when we take things to a drop-off recycling center or a recycling event and follow all the instructions, there still can be unfortunate consequences that are just inherent in the current recycling system, especially once we start talking about global commodity markets and international trade issues. Things we don't necessarily have control over or situations where there isn't oversight that one might hope for. And even if the recycling system were perfect, we'd still be dealing with the environmental damage resulting from production of materials and the fact that recycling only recovers a fraction of the embodied energy and resources of the original material. To illustrate further, let's talk more about electronics. So this is a fast growing industry with an even faster growing waste stream. It, it's Pretty common view that you know if you have an out of date or broken electronic item or you just want an upgrade the proper thing to do is take your gadgets to a special collection event drop off recycling facility um, it is illegal to put certain e-waste items in the garbage like computers tvs and monitors and, and luckily the oregon e-cycles program makes it really easy to recycle electronics so you know it really just makes sense that recycling has become the go-to move for unwanted electronics this is where it gets complicated. So recycling is a perfectly viable option, but this is the part of our bin mindset. And we do need to keep in mind what is happening behind the scenes. So upstream and downstream of recycling. So first let's get some context with some stats. All right, so let's talk about a common item that we're probably holding in our hands right now. And at some point will be considered e-waste, your mobile phone. So on average, people are replacing smartphones every couple of years. So we're moving through a lot of these highly engineered products that hold a treasure trove of material. Smartphones contain something like 30 elements, including copper, gold, and silver for wiring, lithium and cobalt in the battery, not to mention the rare earth metals like yttrium, terbium, and disprosium. And I had to look all three of those up. And I encourage folks to delve a little deeper and read about some of these materials and what it costs to extract them both both environmentally and human rights wise, and what it also means strategically for countries around the world to secure these sources for the future. And recycling will absolutely help keep these elements in use, preventing a lot of the sort of upstream issues in the future. Um, however, even when these devices are recycled, nearly a third of the material right now, including some of these rare earth metals, is lost during recycling processes. They just can't be recovered either due to technological or economic constraints. And aside from that, most of the damage done by your phone isn't in the use or disposal phase anyway. And, and this is a comment you'll just hear multiple times before the end of our talk. So here's an example of some of that upstream damage that I, I mentioned. So this is a picture of a river in Brazil after a mining tailings dam collapse in 2019. That reddish hue is from some iron oxides of these down mineral rich waters. But the main issue is the damage done by the, the built up sediments from the dam that smother the river and the stream beds when the dam fails. Um, the waste water can also be acidic and again, rich in these metals, which is problematic for aquatic life and then the people that rely on those species. Raw material extraction is intense. The natural environment and the people living there tend to suffer the consequences. Not only that, but mining can also fuel political conflict in the countries that have these mineral deposits. And although the impacts from recycling and disposal downstream are small in comparison to the production impacts, that doesn't mean that they are insignificant. This can be devastating to the people trying to make a living through the recycling industry and then the communities where this e-waste ends up. So this is an image um, showing people in uh, Giyu, China, picking through computer cables. And the Basel Action Network is this watchdog group out of Seattle working to combat the export of toxic waste um, from tech and other products. You may have heard about maybe their project, their, it's called E-Trash Transparency Project, where they attach GPS trackers to e-waste in Canada to see where it ended up after being dropped off at a recycling facility. And they found it actually in villages in multiple countries like this, um, where these villages are filled with electronic components, just piles of them. So the process is to extract the valuable me metals in these areas can cause health problems and the piles of leftover waste end up burdening these communities as well as polluting waterways and drinking water. And the answer of course, isn't to give up and just put electronics in garbage. 
but instead understand the importance of leaning into these other strategies like reduce, reuse, and repair. And we'll talk more about these terms, but this is what we're talking about when we say beyond the bin thinking. So I have one more example where the disposal method of choice instead of recycling bins happens to be donation bins. So the fashion industry, it's exploded in the last few decades and subsequently so has the amount of waste it has created. You've probably seen those articles and videos about fast fashion and all the issues surrounding that. We generally try to donate unwanted clothing, right? So again, a perfectly viable method to get rid of things you don't want where it might actually find a new life with someone else. But like with e-waste, production impacts can be intense and the sheer volume of all of this discarded clothing that's flooding domestic and export markets the last couple of decades is causing some of these unintended consequences. So let's take a look at some stats about textiles. So every piece of clothing, like everything, has embodied resources in it. The water, the soil, the fossil fuels, the labor, all needed to create it. So for example, a pair of jeans takes about a thousand gallons of water to make that, that pair of jeans. Um, and 80 billion clothing items are purchased every year. Each one of those clothing items has its own environmental burden. And if you think that what you donate is all getting resold here in the US, you might be surprised to find that 20% of clothing donated to the Goodwill is sold to the Goodwill. And then the rest at 80% is sold to the rag market or international used clothing dealers um, at five to seven cents a pound. And then lastly, even with the amount of clothing that ends up on the secondhand market, over 80% of all US clothing discarded ends up in the landfill still. And that might be directly from households. It might be from some of these overwhelmed donation centers or even retail stores where the brands are intentionally, uh, they wanna damage and discard the new clothing so that the clothing isn't sold on the secondhand market. But again, aside from the donation downstream aspects, the textile production is intense. So this is an image from a village after a flood has inundated an area in Indonesia known for their batik fabrics production and the crimson in the water is from the dyes. So globally, textile mills generate one fifth of the world's industrial water pollution, which consists of 20,000 different chemicals. And I was really surprised to see that there's even that many different chemicals in the textile industry. Um, in the documentary River Blue, there's a quote about uh, being able to tell what the quote, quote, it color of the fashion season is um, by the color of the rivers in China, which is a really depressing quote. Um, generally, millions of acres of land are used for cotton production as well, which leaves soils depleted and uses significant amounts of water and chemical pesticides and fertilizers. So lastly, now we're going to talk about downstream effects of the clothing donations. And this is kind of a little more complicated. So on one hand, it supports a global industry donation does and thousands of jobs, but also comes with a set of its own unintended environmental, social, economic consequences, which aren't clear or commonly known. It's not even that easy to find the data on it, but what is known is some countries have banned or are trying to ban these used clothing imports. And this is an image from Textile Mountain, which is a film about what happens to donated clothing out of Europe. This is um, a riverbank in Kibera, Kenya. And the secondhand clothing sellers in the film comment that they see bales of textiles that are imported where 20 to 50% of the bale is unsellable. Then that disposal burden is shifted essentially from the global north to the global south. And these textiles are dumped in rivers or burned in landfills. And in one interview with a, an activist from a group called Slum Going Green in Kenya that coordinates river cleanups, he describes digging into the riverbanks and just finding layers of mud and clothing but again, not to say donation is a wrong move, it's still a prime recommendation for usable goods. What's really at issue here is the volume of materials being generated, the volume of materials being discarded and overwhelming the infrastructure. So the point of all these slides is not to plunge you into deep despair, but really just to help us be better informed consumers and citizens and bring it into context so that when you hear the phrase reduces first for a reason, you get that full picture of why that is. And these images and these stats, they can feel overwhelming, but also maybe distant and unconnected to daily life. So let me bring it closer to home because the activities that are contributing to the problems we've reviewed so far are also creating issues right here in the US that you might be more familiar with. So maybe some of these images resonate with you. The garage that can't fit a car, the closets overflowing, but nothing to wear. Weekends spent cleaning the garage or the basement or that feeling you get when you have 
when you have to fight through piles of stuff you don't use to find the thing that you need. Or maybe you've noticed that there is a whole industry of self-help and entertainment focused on helping people deal with their crowded and overflowing spaces. So it's clear that we have a stuff issue and it's not super new. George Carlin, as the quote you can see here, saw this trend decades ago. So a home in the US consists of about 300,000 items on average. The US has 3% of the world's kids, but 40% of all the toys. Half of the country feels overwhelmed by clutter. And there were some UCLA researchers that actually did a whole study on this. Um, and they noted that the ongoing burden of managing clutter in the home actually causes an elevated cortisol level throughout the whole day. Um, there are also over 2 billion square feet of self storage space in the US. So housing is the largest, generally the largest part of um, most households' budgets. And even though 75% of Americans park a car outside because the garage is too full to put the car in there, we still spend something like 30 to $40 billion per year on self-storage units. So for most of human history, the accumulation of material wealth has correlated with an increased well, uh, well-being and security. It has just been in the last maybe several decades where some of the world is at that point where more material wealth is not tracking with well-being. In fact, the easy access to cheap stuff may actually be decreasing well-being, both economically and psychologically, in addition to the damage to environmental systems. So what is probably needed is a re-examination of our relationship with stuff to help refocus our time and our energy and finances to the things that matter most, which tend to not actually be things. And while the beyond the bin strategies we're gonna talk about are most useful to prevent many of these issues we've covered, they can also be used in combination with donation and recycling to help deal with too much stuff if you're already there. So now we're at the point where we can start talking about these solutions, hooray. So I'll hand it over to Kate to lead us into this next much more positive section. Thanks Heather. And now that we've covered the why, let's talk about how we think beyond the recycling and the donation bins. The goal of this section is to discuss a few concepts and get you thinking about how you can extend the life of your items. And all of the concepts that we're about to describe here this is collectively is what we were referring to as thinking beyond the bin. This is the waste hierarchy. You've probably seen it before and this tells us the best way to reduce our waste. And you'll notice that recycling sits in the middle of the hierarchy. Reduce and reuse are always at the top because in most cases they provide the biggest financial and environmental benefit. And today we're gonna to focus more on the, these first two, the so reduce and reuse. We'll also look at some of the subtopics wrapped up in reuse, which are repurpose, remanufacture, and repair. We're going to use a TV as an example to help define these terms. And you know, don't take them super literally or get hung up or get hung up on like can this actually happen, but more think of them creatively, use your imagination. Um, and I think you'll see more what I mean in a moment. All right, now when you hear reduce as the first R, what we are really talking about is prevention avoiding the environmental damage by not acquiring the material in the first place. And this is to refuse, which means you avoid the impact of materials by refusing things you don't need. So using this TV example, to reduce would mean that you would not buy a TV. Um, so maybe a TV doesn't fit with your lifestyle or maybe you prefer to watch movies on the computer that you already have, but the result is that you don't buy a new TV. So refusing can mean um, that you don't feel pressured to buy something because of a sale or to take a free gift if you don't need it. If you're the one giving away swag, whether it's for a business event or a party favor, make sure it's something that people actually want, that they'll use, and that they likely don't already have. And whenever possible, don't choose single-use items. Um, there are still options to buy in bulk. Um, you can always look for items with less or no packaging. And I'm starting to see more opportunities to bring our own containers to refill um, or to use for leftovers. Next up is reuse. Um, reuse means to use an item again and again for its original or similar purpose. So continuing with the TV example, you would buy a used TV instead of a new one. Um, there are some other ways to reuse. And so I mentioned a moment ago about single use plastics. And one of the best ways to avoid that is to create a zero waste kit that has like a water bottle or cup as well as a silverware, napkins, food storage, a grocery bag, you know, any of these items that you always want to have on hand. So you don't choose a single use item just because you're kind of left there empty handed. 
You can also borrow items instead of buying. Um, and then, of course, maintenance. It's important for more than your car, you know, so you want to take care of and repair items to give them a longer life. And then that brings us to a different type of reuse, which is repurpose. So repurposing is taking one material and using it for a different purpose than it was intended for. Um, when a project, a product has reached the end of its useful life and its primary purpose, it doesn't mean that there's no other use. So continuing with this TV example, you would repurpose a TV into something else instead of recycling it. So the, what you see on your screen, the TV has been turned into an aquarium, which again, don't get hung, off, hung up on this as possible. Just know that while it no longer serves its old purpose, it has found a new purpose. And so repurposing is creatively thinking about how an item's characteristic can be used for another purpose when its primary purpose is obsolete. And moving on to another type of reuse, we have remanufacturing. It's similar to what we probably think of as refurbishing, and it's the process of rebuilding a product using a combination of reused, repaired, or new parts. So we bring this up not necessarily as a strategy that you'd use it at home, but if you come across items that are marketed as remanufactured products while you're shopping, know that they meet or exceed the original equipment manufacturer specifications. This means that they've undergone a more rigorous testing than some items that are marketed as refurbished or repaired. But know that you could employ some of these remanufacturing concepts at home, like with your car. So if you've ever replaced parts of your car with new or used parts, you've done this. You didn't just go get a new car when your, bat, your headlight went out, you replaced it. And, think, and as you think about how you can use this strategy at other homes, ask yourself these other questions. Can I replace a couple parts instead of the whole thing? Or could I use these parts for another project? Late with the transition. Um, and now we're, um, I know we're focused on reduce and reuse in this section, but I really wanted to add in the quick comparison of recycling so you can see how this process fits in and what's involved. Um, so when an item or material is recycled, it undergoes a transformation that renders the original materials basically unrecognizable. So in this example, not only has the TV been dismantled, but the parts have been crushed and grinded and melted to a point where they can be used as feedstock to be made into something new. And I just also wanna note, sometimes recycling is the best option and that's okay. Um, like I said, this is a suite of tools that you can choose. And if you find yourself in a situation where you are bummed out or you know, don't wanna continue recycling items, you can ask yourself, what were my other options? or how do I recycle right? All right, now we are going to put some of this into practice. Um, we're gonna put your creativity to the test and sharpen our repurposing skills with a few examples. So we're about to share some examples and for each one, use the chat box to kind of brainstorm the different ideas for how you can repurpose the items that we're gonna share. So I'm gonna invite Heather back on to join me. Okay, great. So let's start with an everyday item. Uh, let's use um, a cereal box. So think about all the things we can do with this cereal box once we're done with that cereal. And you know, when you're kind of brainstorming it, you can ask yourself questions like, oh, what are the main characteristics of this item that make it work for its original purpose? And how can I then use that to my advantage for a new purpose? So what's it made out of? Can I cut it up or fold it? What modifications can I make to this new item? So if you have any ideas, have you ever use a cereal box to I see wrap a gift yep it's a it's a perfectly good gift box <laughs> um yeah mm -hmm. canvas for art very nice oh hide cookies in it I like that <laughs> um <laughs> yep so yeah we let's uh put up kitty enrichment oh some there you go some toys we've got a couple pictures of um reuse or repurpose ideas already kind of lined up we've got we can use the box shape um, is perfectly suited for magazines. Uh, easily that the shape and the size work perfectly for that. Um, it's got that rigidity like folders. So instead of heading to the you know, office supply store, you can just use the cereal boxes that you have or other paperboard boxes. Um, what else we got? We've got, I think we have a creative repurpose from uh, a kid who made it into a, a little car. And then of course, very seasonal. Um, is a 
it's been woven into a an Easter basket. So this is the idea of like instead of heading to your your dollar store or something to find some of these things, just use uh, use what you already have, kind of you've already brought into your house. Um, yeah, let's uh, have another. Let's try another example here. Good job, everybody. Like your creativity. So the next example, I'm gonna let Kate tee this up. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, so this is coming from a real life example. Um, this this bucket, excuse me, this decommissioned baggage conveyor belt. Um, this is from the airport, and so uh, let's look at the characteristics. So this material is it's a woven polyester fabric rubber combination. Um, so that means it's rubbery, it's waterproof, it's stretchy. And so kind of knowing those um, characteristics, does anybody have any ideas how you could repurpose this um, baggage conveyor belt? Oh, gardening. Okay. Like yeah, gardening. <laughs> I could totally see that. Uh, oh, flip inside, yeah. slide. I like that. <laughs> or yoga mat. That's getting close. Uh, roofing for a doghouse, to line a path, more roofing mm -hmm. or playground material. material. These are all, yeah, really good suggestions. Um, and so actually what happened in 2015, the airport partnered with St. Vincent de Paul um, and another organization, and they converted these baggage belts into sleeping mats. And so um, that's certainly something that is in need um, and not at all what this was originally designed for. So I'm going to pass this back over to you, Heather, to introduce this next example. Okay, so the next one we have are fire hoses. Now, fire hoses, they need to be in top shape for performance and safety to deal with that high pressure water. So urban and wildlands fire crews, are they often go through tons of these. Um, and they can't be reused to, to fight fires, but what could they be used for? So let's review some of their components and attributes. So they have this durable cotton or polyester outer covering. Um, again, that makes it very durable. and Inside, it's like this watertight rubber or neoprene liner. Um, they're flexible. They come in these long lengths. And you can ask yourself, can it be, can you uh, weave these hoses together to make something or cut it up or sew it into new items? And um, if anybody has any ideas of how they would use this, I've got a soaker hose. Um, I've seen examples where this has been used as um, uh, boat pier bumper guards. It's been woven into fencing or, um, or actually, I think um, we had an, uh, an example of maybe using it for a hose, but not a fire hose, but maybe as um, a hose for a concrete pumper truck. Uh, there's also a, I see a belt, truck tie, truck tie straps, very good. And there's an organization called Hose to Habitat where they actually use old fire hoses in zoo habitats. Um, they disguise them to make them look like vines for um, some of their uh, habitat designs. So what is actually what uh, a real life example is of what um, prompted this uh, slide, what this hose was used for, it's actually um, parking uh, space dividers. So in you know, mountainous areas where it's a gravel parking lot, you know, your paint's not going to work. So they made a durable um, parking lot divider that they could kind of nail into the into the, the gravel there. Super cool. That was a hard one. So great ideas, yeah. everybody. <laughs> All right. All so right. next up, we have a a used mattress. Um, so we can see it's fabric, it's not waterproof, um, there's likely holes or tears, it looks like it's made of stuffing that could be cotton or some sort of foam, and there might be some metal springs or coils in there. And so does this kind of get anybody thinking about what this could potentially be repurposed into? Outdoor furniture okay, cushions. Out oh, I like that. Well, those are strangely expensive for some reason, so that'd be cool. Um, and I think kind of continuing along that theme, just, you know, stuffing would be a good idea, um, whether that's in pillows, cushions, or even used as carpet padding. And I think in general, fabric, too, it can also be used in insulation. Um, maybe not this exact mattress, but you could also use it to reupholster other items if the fabric is in good shape. Um, 
And let's see. So this dog bed, um, or this mattress was turned into a dog bed. And so it was actually the St. Vincent de Paul in Eugene. They, um, there's a dogma pet, pet, pet beds. Um, and so that's one of their businesses. And um, they make these really cute dog beds out of old mattresses. All right, well, congratulations, everyone. You've all earned the power of resourcefulness through your creativity. And now we're gonna go into Thank another section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the next section is um, a way to kind of level up our reuse, repair and share skills. So um, Kate's gonna take it away. Yeah, so I just wanted to share some examples of ways that you can reuse, repair and share. So um, you probably heard of a library, right? And now they do more than books. There's all sorts of like household goods. Um, some have tools, there's musical equipment, toys, all sorts of things. Um, there's also tool libraries that are really great if you just need tools for a very specific time. Um, and then you have secondhand stores like Habitat, which just has tons of, of household goods and usually they're in really great quality. Um, and then you have shoe repairs shop, which are pretty great at extending the life of your favorite shoes. Um, and then we also have online resources. There are so many options, but there are things like um, OfferUp, your Buy Nothing groups, uh, Let Go, Facebook Marketplace, Nextdoor, all sorts of things where you can um, give away items or you can find items for free. And Heather, out of all of these, like you have a little story or something <laughs> that you would consider like a success that you wanted to share? Yeah. Um... The habitat, you know, the restores that those are always my happy places, but I have a specific story with the buy nothing groups. I've had um, really good experiences with my, my neighborhood buy nothing group. Um, recently, I built a kind of a workshop in or a workbench in my garage and I just needed a, a handful of two by fours cut into short lengths and rather than going to the big box store and getting a full length, you know, eight foot two by four, I just posted on um, I buy nothing group if anybody had any scrap lumber lying around and someone did it was um, some extras from a project that they had done and they probably just been lying around uh, in case they ended up making another you know making uh, something else out of it so so that was pretty cool how about you oh that's awesome. Yeah, actually. So growing up, I remember my mom always used to take her sandals um, to the cobbler, the shoe re repair shop. And, um, you know, every couple of years, she'd have to get them resold. And, um, you know, they're the kind of have like the cork underneath there. But the top part is perfectly, you know, in great shape, fits her foot, all the good things. And so she's actually passed those down to me because I'm lucky enough um, that we're the same size. And so now I'm kind of conti continuing this tradition where I have these shoes that were my mom's um, that now I continue to get repaired and I'm going to do that as long as I can because they are just wonderful and they hold a lot of great memory. So that was a fun one. Nice. Okay, great. Well, that story actually is a great transition um, into our last section. So repair is a major part of the whole reuse picture, um, keeping useful stuff in use. And there's been a lot going on with repair recently and the opportunities to participate in repair culture and support the repair economy. Um, some things just need to be fixed, but that's not always quite as easy as it may have been in the past. So back to the TV example, you know, back in the day, you might call a repair person or find a repair shop for your TV instead of replacing it. Um, who, you know, who remembers some of these infomercials about TV VCR repair courses? They were kind of everywhere, but you don't see those much anymore. And when was the last time you heard about someone taking their TV to a repair shop? So the DEQ was actually looking into why everyday practices of reuse and repair aren't quite as common as they've been in the past. And although retail stores for used goods have actually grown in Oregon for the last 20 years, the repair industries have continued to contract and be, have become less and less accessible. So let's talk about why that might be. So some barriers and challenges to repair are for manufacturers, brands, and designers. We see increasingly complex designs and some products almost seem like they're designed for disposal and replacement. This is kind of the planned obsolescence you might've heard about. Some manufacturers use proprietary screws. Here's an example of just some of the different drill bits you might need if you were to try and repair things. Or instead of screws, the components are glued together, which is difficult to kind of disassemble when things are glued together or batteries aren't replaceable. You know, can you imagine replacing your car or sending it to the manufacturer every time the battery needed replacement? Um, there is some confusion about warranties. You may have to wait several weeks before a warranty service provider can get to you 
length or the short length of warranties can be surprising. Um, sometimes manufacturers tell their customers that warranties would be voided if they engaged in repair. Um, however, the Federal Trade Commission sent warning letters a couple years ago to companies um, basically that said those stickers that say void warranty if removed were actually a violation of federal consumer rights. A major barrier to repair though is just simply not having access to repair documentation, spare parts, um, the right kind of software or reset firmware um, or special tools. And you might have heard about right to repair legislation. There's, you know, 25 states have been exploring this this year. And although um, the bill in Oregon didn't quite make it out of committee, um, you can still track what's happening around the country through the USPIRG, um, I guess it's USPIRG webpage, because uh, you might hear about right to repair in the future. I think that's something that we're going to see more and more, more of. All right, but it's not just manufacturers. We as people of the world that like to acquire and use things, we're throwing up some of our own barriers and we can probably do something about that. So our consumption patterns have changed, you know, back in the day, oh, we're kind of um, had a, a more permanent relationship with the things we purchased. Um, but now even these incredible handheld supercomputers, um, we kind of treat them as disposable, you know, the screen breaks or it slows down a little and we recycle them and replace them. Um, this also happens with appliances. There was a study in the UK where researchers pulled about 200 microwave ovens from a recycling center and found that nearly all of them were actually reusable, most only needing minor repairs and, and uh, issues to be fixed, a lot of cosmetic issues. Um, some of this churning through products is just due to changing trends. This is most obvious in fashion and home decor, but also in electronics and companies know that. Then there is kind of the calculation that we do in our head with the cost of repair and convenience. You know, if it costs a certain amount to repair, even if it's less than replacing, but there's some inconvenience, you might think, ah, oh, I might as well just buy a new one. This creates a feedback loop where new product retailers are supported and repair shops are not. And then they need to raise prices to stay in business or disappear making it even less convenient to repair. You know, a big part of that microwave study I mentioned was a survey of people dropping off appliances for recycling, and most of them didn't know about reuse or repair places, just the recycle center. Luckily in our area, we do have a Portland Repair Finder, and this is a, a website that maps out repair businesses across the whole metro region, not just Portland. So I think we have that link in the chat. And lastly, repair knowledge is the kind of stuff that usually gets passed down through generations. So sewing skills, woodworking skills, electrical skills, but that's being lost um, as it's becoming easier and cheaper to simply replace things. But what I do love um, is that the internet and sites like YouTube or iFixit allow folks who were never taught these skills at home have access to uh, a lot of teachers online now. So, what do we do about this? Well, let's talk about some businesses um, that are, are, are kind of bucking the trend of um, kind of businesses have this incentive to design a product to last just long enough for consumers to believe in, but not so long that they won't or don't need to buy more in the future. But some of these businesses are actually, um, you know, in defiance to this model, they're thinking about how to reduce consumer waste. So an example is a Swedish company called Nudie Jeans. They are offering free repairs at their shops. Patagonia partners with iFixit to teach consumers how to repair their clothing. They also have a repair program that fixes 40,000 items every year at their Nevada facility. And then their campaign, buy once, buy well, and mend. It's great advice. And speaking of iFixit, so this is a kind of a good story. So iFixit started with Kyle Weens, um, who's actually from Bend. He was in college late one night trying to fix his iBook, very frustrated because he couldn't find a repair manual. So that sent him on a mission. And 15 years later, he's got this organization that offers hundreds of online crowdsourced tutorials, repair manuals, tear down instructions, all for free. This is a huge resource to DIYers, repair businesses, and community repair events worldwide. So I also wanted to highlight some local repair businesses that recently received grant funding, I guess the last few years, from the DQ for Workforce Development. So there's um, a place called the Renewal Workshop in Cascade Locks. They take items from ret retailers that were damaged or returned by the customer, and they make them into renewed products. JD's Shoe Repair in Portland, they trained a cobbler with the grant funding. Garten Services also trained some people for disassembly and reuse of electronic components. 
and Free Geek funded training and certification for seven repair techs who could potentially go out and start their own repair business. So that was the business side. What's happening on the community side? Um, repair Cafe, you might've heard about the repair cafes around the world. This was started 10 years ago in Amsterdam and it has inspired thousands of pop-up repair events and or organizations and groups all over the world, including Repair PDX, Gresham Repair Cafe, Repair Clark County, and of course, Repair Fairs in Washington County and Clackamas counties. Repair Fair has been around for about six years and I'll explain a little bit more about these events in a minute uh, for those who are not familiar. However, I do wanna note that pop-up community events, the in-person ones have mostly been put on hold, but there are some remote or socially distance type activities from these groups. Um, Repair Fair in Washington County is also in a bit of a transition. So we don't have a webpage right now, but keep an eye out um, as we kind of reemerge uh, working our way through 2021. Uh, I also want to highlight the Fix-It Clinic. So this is a repair group out of the Bay Area, again, started by a student, uh, Peter Mui, who wanted to demystify consumer tech and empower people to disassemble and repair their stuff via community repair events. So these in-person events moved online last year, and that means that anyone from around the world can actually join. So the next intergalactic repair event from the Fix-It Clinic um, is this Saturday. So basically people sign up their items for repair, then get coaching from fixers around the world to troubleshoot and repair their items. I've attended as, a, as an observer a few times um, and it can actually be pretty entertaining if that's, that's your thing. So we'll drop a link to the sign up from there in the chat as well. Okay, so if you aren't familiar with community pop-up events, at its most basic level, it's a group of skilled volunteers that help people fix things. But it's not just a free fixing service. These are events, they're opportunities for community building and learning. And in an optimal setting, the fixers are the coaches, the teachers, they're passing on their knowledge and experience and getting attendees involved in their own repair. I love seeing attendees come back as volunteers. So what can be fixed at a pop-up repair event? Well, it really depends on the volunteers, but we see all kinds of items. As long as it can be carried or rolled into the event space, it might be able to be fixed. So we have about 100 people have shown interest in volunteering for repair fair, but it's really about 10 to 15 regular volunteers that have kept this effort going the last five years. These are your neighbors, they're your electricians, um, they were computer and smartphone experts, SOAS engineers, DIYers, and skilled tinkerers. And typically um, during the events, textiles and small appliances make up I mean, about half of the items we see. Um, since 2015, there's been nearly 40 events and we fixed nearly 1500 items and the success rate for for these items is, is pretty high it's, it's kind of impressive all our volunteers are pretty awesome um, consistently 60 to 70 percent and what has become apparent um, while coordinating these events is that there's so much more at play here than just fixing things and saving the environment we have neighbors helping neighbors, volunteers sharing knowledge they've acquired over decades, people learning how to troubleshoot and, and learning new skills, um, forming friendships, and then people have a place to go if they can't afford to replace their, their things that broke. Um, and I do wanna mention something else that's cool that kind of illustrates when people get together, you can figure things out. So we hosted a, an event at Hillsborough Library, but just before the event, we had this tutorial for volunteers about the library's 3D printer. It was you know, kind of new, it's it kind of cool. Then at the next event, someone came in with a metal and glass set of patio tables where the plastic brackets had broken. She couldn't find a replacement online or from the manufacturer, but Travis, one of our awesome volunteers, actually copied the design of the remaining bracket, 3D printed the rest, and now those tables are tables instead of scrap metal and glass, glass trash. So um, that was kind of a, a cool little outcome of one of our events. So that's where I'm gonna end it. Um, and you might be thinking, okay, so we've had this whole hour, what now? So I wanna encourage people to definitely continue to recycle. It, it does work, but we just need to make sure we're following the instructions. So check out the What to Recycle Where tool on the Garbage and Recycling Day app or on our webpage for guidance. But don't rely on recycling as the only way to deal with discards. Explore those beyond the bin strategies. Check out repair resources, find online marketplaces to share, trade, or find secondhand items. Most importantly, reconsider what you buy and how much stuff you actually need. And of course, always keep learning. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kate to wrap us up. Great, we have a lot more um, learning opportunities this month. So be sure to check out the last two topics in our Earth Month webinar series. 
Next week, we'll be diving into food waste with the Eat Smart Waste Less presentation. And then on the 27th of April, the topic is green cleaners and healthy homes. And check out the chat box for the registration link for those. Also, keep your eye out for an app-based scavenger hunt that we're hosting. We're using this really cool goose chase scavenger hunt platform, and it's going to launch during Earth Week. There will be hundreds of missions, it's super interactive and really fun for the whole family, and plus there are prizes. And if you are interested in having somebody from our business team um, assist your workplace with recycling, food scraps collection, or beyond the bin thinking, send us a request. And again, check your chat for that link. And if you do Facebook, be sure to follow us. We post tips and resources, um, as well as notifications for waste-related events and activities. And it's a really good way to keep up with what's happening in the area. And lastly, we'll be sending a follow-up email later this week with links um, and everything in a recording. And you will get a PDF of this presentation. And these are all active links. So we shared a lot of info today. And you can come to this page and just click through anything here. And I just want to thank you all for taking time out of your evening to join us. Um, you're all awesome, and we can make a difference. Everything adds up. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you at some of our future events. Thanks, everyone.